So we might want to head out to Sunday school. We'll turn in our Bibles to Psalm 46 because this is where we'll be taking our thoughts this morning. Psalm 46, and we're looking at God, our refuge. Before we go any further, let's just pause and ask the Lord's blessing on our thoughts this morning. <coughs> Lord Jesus, we do indeed lift our hearts to you and praise you, for you are fairer and brighter and purer than anything else. Lord, you are worthy of praise because you are the Son of God who came to this earth to be our Saviour. Lord, we thank you for your love, we thank you for uh, your sacrifice, and we thank you that we can experience the benefit of all that you have done for us still to this day. We pray, Lord, that as we look into your word this morning, we'll be conscious of your presence here with us, of your Holy Spirit speaking to our hearts. May we listen, and Lord, may we respond true faith, Lord, and strengthen us, we pray, for Jesus' sake. In this first verse, the psalmist uses the word refuge. I'm using the AV this morning, and the word actually appears three times in this psalm. In verse 1, it says, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. And then again, in verse 7 and in verse 11, the Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge or stronghold. In each case, the word is a reference to God. One of my abiding childhood memories was hearing the foghorn sounding from the St. Abbs Lighthouse. There's something reassuring, almost calming, about hearing it on a day when the fog was thick and everything was cast in a damp grey light. In today's digital age, the lighthouse isn't used anymore. It's been years since the foghorn last gave out its warning. Today, the lighthouse is a holiday light. But the cliffs around it are still known for their wildlife, particularly as a nesting ground for seabirds. We know it as the St. Anne's Wildlife Refuge. It's called a refuge because it's a place where the seabirds and other wildlife have special protection. Now, we live in a troubled world. Sometimes the news can make us fearful. Fear is a debilitating condition. Fear keeps us back. It holds us down. It shuts us up. Fear can paralyze and isolate you. If the devil can make you afraid, then he's got you right where he wants you. But this psalm reminds us that God is our refuge. There's a safe place for the child of God, for the one who belongs to the Lord. The Christian doesn't need to live in fear. Now in the Bible, there are four different words, four different Hebrew words that are translated refuge. Two of these words are used right here in the psalm. But each one of these words reveals something wonderful about God and what he can do for, for us. So Psalm 46 verse 1, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Here the word means shelter, a place of protection. Think of a lean-to or a, a windbreak, a tent that gives you protection from the elements. <coughs> I remember growing up as a kid, it's amazing how sometimes your mind works and what, how we... We go down to the beach on Eyemouth in the summer, and people would have all these, these um, you know, canvas whatever, the stakes, and they'd be changing on one side of them. I try to think. I, I understand, you know, that nobody on the other side can see them changing, but what about everybody over here? And I never did figure out that. In fact, it wasn't until I was an adult I realised it wasn't about modesty; it was about protecting yourself from the wind. What a difference it can make when you're on the right side of a windbreak. It can be like winter on the one side, with the wind and the sea buffeting on the other side, safe and warm and cosy, and you can enjoy sunshine on the beach. Anyways, that's the word here. It's a lean to, a windbreak, right? The same word is used in Psalm 104 and verse 18, where it says, The high hills are a refuge for the wild goats, 
and for the rock and the rocks for the conies. Here it means essentially a hiding place. The wild goats and the conies live among the rocks high up in the mountains. The little conies rarely venture far from the crevices where they make their home in the rocks. If danger appears, then they can quickly run back and disappear into the rocks for safety. Several years ago, we were traveling in the American West, in Colorado. And uh, we had meetings in the Denver area. And while we were there, we decided to take the family up into the Rocky Mountains. And I remember as we were driving up in the mountains, we came across several cars that were parked off to the side of the road. People were out looking over the edge. They were looking at the chasm below. So I decided to stop and see what they were looking at. <coughs> so we looked across the chasm to the mountain on the other side of the road. It was little more than a sheer rock cliff. A vertical wall of stone. And yet about halfway up that cliff, beside that impossible cliff face, there was a flock of mountain sheep. Sometimes we can find refuge in the most unlikely places. Years ago I read the story of Corrie Ten Boom. She lived through the terrible years of the Second World War. Her story is called, she, the book that she wrote about her experiences, The Hiding Place. She and her family helped provide a hiding place in their home for Jews throughout the war. But one day, they got a knock on the door and they opened it to see some German soldiers standing there. They searched the home and they found the hiding place where they were at that moment hiding some Jews. They were all taken away. Corey and all her family were arrested. Family was split up. They never saw their elderly father again. He died in captivity. Corey and her sister Betty were taken off to a concentration camp, a prison camp. Eventually, they end up in Ravensbrück, one of the worst of the death camps. The conditions there were inhuman. The two sisters, however, had managed to smuggle, against all odds, a Bible into the camp. God gave Corey a verse which provided her with both comfort and assurance during those times. It was Psalm 32 and verse 7, where it says of God, You are my hiding place. You shall preserve me from trouble. You shall compass me about with songs of deliverance. After spending some time at Ravensbrook, the sisters noticed there was one place in all the camp where the soldiers never came. They never entered into the ladies' dormitories. You see, the dormitories were infested with lice. But because of that, it was the one place in the entire camp where the women were left alone. The one place where they were safe. The ten boon sisters began a Bible study in uh, there in one of the buildings. And soon a large number of women would gather there were on a regular basis for prayers and for encouragement from God's Word. It was their very own special hiding place. Turn, if you will, to Psalm 91. Just a few pages over. Reading just the opening verses of this psalm. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. My God, in Him will I trust. Surely He shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. He shall cover you with His feathers and under His wings you will trust. His truth will be your shield and buckler. You will not be afraid for the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flies by day. The same word for refuge appears here again in this psalm, in verse 2. I will say of the Lord, he's my refuge and my fortress. In fact, it appears twice in the psalm, verse 8 also. Um, it says, uh, only with thine eyes shalt thou see and behold the reward of the wicked, because you have made the Lord, who is my refuge, even the Most High, your habitation. So in verse 4, the psalmist gives us a very familiar picture, that of the mother hen protecting her chicks. He shall cover thee with his feathers and under his wings 
you will trust. I'm sure you've heard uh, possibly the well-known story of a farmer uh, who lived out in the American <coughs> prairies and one day he could see a prairie fire making its way, bearing down across the countryside towards his homestead. And so he got out and did what he could to protect the house, kind of dug up kind of a, um, a, 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 what do you call it, a, a fire break around the farm and he doused everything he could with as much water from the well to try and protect the buildings from the storm. And once the fire storm had passed by, he then went out to inspect the damage. He came across a small charred blackened stump in the farmyard. He kicked it over and to his amazement several little chicks scurried out unharmed. The charred stump was all that was left of the mother hen. She'd seen the fire coming and had gathered the little chicks under her wings. She risked her own life rather than to see her chicks come to harm. Every time I think of the story, I'm reminded of the words of Jesus. You remember that time he came to the Mount of Olives, and from there he could look out across the valley and see the city of Jerusalem spread out before him on the opposite hillside. How he longed to see the people responding to the truth, to accept him as their Messiah, as the one who'd come to bring them salvation. But they turned their backs on him. And who can forget his poignant words, O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often would I have gathered your children together, even as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. But you would not. You would have nothing to do with me. Jeremiah 17, the same word again appears, twice translated there, hope. Verse 7, blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord and whose hope is in the Lord. And in verse 17 it says of the Lord, you are my hope in the day of trouble. It's the same word translated refuge in the Psalms. God is our hiding place. He is our shelter. He is our hope. All of that from this one word. Years ago, my parents took us all to visit some friends, uh, friends of the family who were living in Austria at the time. I was about 11 years old. One of the places that we visited while we were there was Mauthausen. Mauthausen had been the largest concentration camp in Austria. The camp was notorious for its brutality. When the bodies of the prisoners were being burned, burned in the ovens, so hot were the flames, uh, the fires that the flames could be seen shooting out uh, of the top of these enormous chimney stacks. When we visited the camp, it had been 30 years since the war. And the campsite had all been cleaned up and tidied. There was uh, still, though, a palpable feeling of evil in the air. I mean, the day we were there, the sun was shining, much like today. It was an eerily silent place. People still only spoke in whispers. The locals would say that uh, the birds still refused to sing anywhere near it. I, my brothers and sisters, we were too young to appreciate fully all that that place represented, but we still didn't like it there and couldn't wait to get away. Just outside the camp, there was a quarry, it's still there, not used anymore. And there's a steep staircase that led from the bottom of the quarry up to where the prison camp was. A stairway of 186 steps, straight up and down, on the side of the hill. They became known as the stairs of death. German soldiers would stand at the top of the stairway. They'd wait until the steps were filled with prisoners carrying heavy burdens on their, their backs up the hillside until they were all lined up and then the guard would kick or shove the one at the top and the prisoners like dominoes would all begin to fall down and they were crushed to their death below. Sometimes the prisoners were ordered to stack the boulders to one side of the quarry they would spend all day long with this back-breaking work for perhaps uh, days at a time. And then when the job was done, the soldiers would turn around and ask them to carry it right back to the place where they just <laughs> moved them from. And they would do this time and again. With these pointless, meaningless tasks, the soldiers were trying to break down the prisoners' resistance. To show them there was no hope. There was no hope of escape. No hope for deliverance. It's been said that hope is the last thing to die in a man. 
As long as we've got hope, we can keep going. But when someone loses all hope, that person is well nigh finished. You know, the devil seeks to rob you of your hope. He tries to convince you that you have no reason to continue. That you're beyond hope. It's a lie. And he knows it, but he still keeps telling it to you anyways. He wants to destroy you because the devil is a liar and a murderer from the beginning. John 8 verse 44. He'll tell you that you're beyond hope. You've made such a mess of things that not even God can help. He'll tell you that God couldn't possibly love you. But the prophet Jeremiah says, My hope is in the Lord. He is my hope in the day of evil. And with the Lord, there is always hope. Sometimes here we sing the hymn, My hope is in the Lord who gave himself for me. He paid the price of all my sin at Calvary. No merit of my own his anger to suppress. My only hope is found in Jesus and his righteousness. So you see, the Lord is our refuge. He's our hiding place. He's our shelter. He's our hope. When the Lord is your refuge, He will protect you. He will protect you from the storms of life, from the attacks of Satan, and indeed, from the very fires of hell itself. When the Lord is your refuge, you have nothing to fear. That's the first word. Now, there's a second word, translated refuge, in our Bible, and to find that one, we need to turn to Psalm 59. <coughs> Psalm 59, and verse 16. Second last verse of the psalm. I will sing of thy power. Yes, I will sing aloud of your mercy in the morning. For you have been my defense and refuge in the day of my trouble. The word here literally means a place to which to flee. Like a retreat. A secluded place where you can retire. For safety, for contemplation, for personal refreshment. A place where you can escape from worldly demands. Now we Scots love our gardens. I love a garden. On those days when the sun is shining and the air is warm enough, I love to sit outside in the garden and to read and just enjoy being out there, the fresh air. Something at least peaceful about being in a garden. Someone once said, one is nearer God's heart in a garden than anywhere else on earth. You think about the number of gardens in the Bible. If everything began in the garden, and everything, in a sense, is going to end up in a beautiful place where there are trees and fruit for the healing of the nations. And think of how much of our modern lives are spent surrounded by man-made structures, concrete and steel and glass. Our days and nights are spent under artificial lights, breathing recycled air. Few places are more peaceful and restorative than a garden where we can experience the beauty of God's creation. Do you have a special place where you can get away from the noise and the distractions of life? Where you can spend some quiet time in the presence of the Lord? Do you remember David, the King of Israel? How many of the Psalms that were, were, have been a, a source of spiritual encouragement and refreshment to people down through the ages. The first time we come across David, where is he? He's out in the fields, tending to his father's flock. How many hours did David spend out there in nature, in the quiet of nature, contemplating God? Similarly, later in life, David found himself as an outcast. He had to live from hand to mouth in the wilderness, far away from uh, the city, far away from, from the normal distractions of life. And there daily in the wilderness, again he experienced the presence and the protection of God. And then think of Jesus himself. 
Matthew chapter 14 and verse 23, we find him sending the multitudes away why? So they might go up into a mountain alone to pray. And we're told that when the evening was come, he was still there. How often throughout Jesus' life do we read of him, of the Lord getting apart, sometimes with his disciples, sometimes alone, getting in a quiet place in order that he could pray. The last time we find Jesus, before he was taken and crucified, he was praying in a garden. The garden. Gethsemane. So how important it is then for us that we too have a place, a retreat, a place that we can go to and rest in the presence of God. To get away from those things that distract us, from the crowd, from the noise, from the restless agitation of the world. Get alone and spend some time in communion with the Lord. Spend some personal time in His Word and in prayer. And spending time together with other Christians is also a part of that, isn't it? Worshipping with fellow believers in church. Churches should be a place of shelter from the world. A place where people can come and experience the healing power of God's love and His peace. So that's another word referring to the idea of God our refuge. The third Hebrew word translated refuge in our Bibles is found in further back in Numbers, Numbers chapter 35. So you, first book in the Bible is Genesis, and then there's Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers. It's book number four in your Old Testament. Numbers 35, if you could turn there for a moment. Otherwise, just listen. But I'm going to be reading from verses 9 through 12. So Numbers chapter 35, beginning in verse 9. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, and say to them, When you come over Jordan into the land of Canaan, then you shall appoint cities to be cities of refuge for you, that the slayer may flee there, who kills any person unawares. And they shall be to you cities for refuge from the avenger, that the manslayer die not until he stand before the congregation in judgment. This word, refuge, here refers to a restricted place, an asylum, a place of legal protection from a pursuer or from an enemy, a place of immunity where you're safe from prosecution. In the Old Testament, cities of refuge were set up for the protection, not of the guilty, but of the innocent. Let's say an accident happened at work. Or on a farm, you're chopping a tree and the axe head flew off and someone was injured. Or perhaps even accidentally killed. You could then run to the nearest city of refuge and if you got through the city gates, there you would be safe from any act of revenge. No one could touch you. At least until time you could be brought before the court and a decision made on whether you were innocent or guilty. In medieval times, the church was considered a place of sanctuary. Anyone could flee to the church, and there they were to be safe from harm, at least in principle. It was considered the worst of crimes during those times to attack or kill someone in a church. And in modern times, we still speak about places of refuge for asylum seekers. A place to which the innocent may flee and escape in times of persecution or war. And the Bible tells us that in God's sight, we're all sinners. That there's none righteous, no, not one, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And that is appointed unto a man once to die, and after that, the judgment. As sinners, we are exposed to the full extent of God's justice against sin. What hope then is there for any of us? We all, each one of us, deserve to pay for our sin and our guilt. But in Jesus, we may find protection. Full immunity from sin and its eternal consequences. In 1 John, uh, what, uh, the, the Apostle John writes, These things have I written unto you that you sin not. But if any one of you sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. 
with propitiation of the sacrifice for your sins. And not for your sins only, but indeed for the sins of the whole world. You see, Jesus is much more than just our defender, because the Bible tells us that he also is the one who paid the debt for our sins. He took the sentence, our sentence, on himself and suffered and died in our place. He himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sin, should live unto righteousness. It's by his stripes that we are healed. 1 Peter 2.24 And through Jesus, we have full immunity from the law against sin. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Therefore being justified by faith or being made right through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. All who are guilty of sin may run to the cross of Christ and there find refuge for your soul. I wonder, have you come to Jesus for your soul's salvation? Are your sins forgiven? Has your slate been wiped clean before God? Jesus and Jesus alone is the refuge for your soul. There's a fourth and final word our Bibles sometimes translate refuge, and for that we need to turn back to where we began, Psalm 46. <laughs> the first word had to do with a hiding place, a shelter. But in verses 7 and 11, there is a different word used for the word refuge. The Lord of hosts is with us, the God of Jacob is our refuge. Here, this word refers to a cliff, a high place, a lofty, inaccessible place, a high tower, or a fortress, a stronghold. <coughs> Proverbs 18 and verse 10 says, The name of the Lord is a strong tower, and the righteous run into it and are safe. The UK, of course, is known for its many castles. Where we live right here on the Scottish borders and the Northumberland, apparently there are more castles here than any other region in the country. It has to do a bit with our warlike heritage here. All the fighting along the borders. And of course along our coasts, many castles were first built uh, in response to the attacks of the Vikings. It's amazing to note how many of these castles were built on a high point, on top of a hill, or a major promontory, all the better to be able to see the enemy coming and to protect yourself from attack. We live here, of course, in a small town on the North Sea. Years ago, on the cliff overlooking the bay, there was once a fort. It was built in the 16th century with French money as a defence against attack from our neighbours to the south. The fort doesn't exist today. All that's left are the remains of a few earthen works, defense works. But the story is told of a famous battle that once took place there. It happened during the night while the Scottish soldiers were asleep in their beds. The English tried to sneak up the cliff and take the fort by surprise. But as they crept up the sides of the cliff, the seagulls nesting in the cliff face were aroused and began squawking. The noise alerted the Scottish soldiers within. They jumped out of the beds and they grabbed whatever weapons they could and ran out to defend themselves. Many soldiers didn't even have time enough to put on their shoes. Hence the name of the battle, the Battle of the Barefoots. The day was saved because of the seagulls. And you know they still make their nests in the cliffs. A place of safety, a place of refuge from the stormy winds. Same word not only refers to a high place, but it always carries with it, also carries with it the meaning of safety, place of safety, safety from attack, a stronghold. There's a small watchtower just further over the Scottish borders called Hume Castle. Some of you have probably been there. I performed a wedding there once. It sits on the top of a high hill. It doesn't look like much. But after you know where it is, you realize you can see it from all over the borders. 
Whoever first built that tower knew exactly what they were doing. There's little that can move across the valley that can't be seen from that tower. So a fortress then is a place where you can watch out for the enemy. Of course, the Bible tells us to be sober, be vigilant for your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion walks about seeking whom he may devour. He's out to devour you. So a stronghold then is a place where you can be prepared for any possible attack. But it's also a place that can serve as a base from which then you can go forth. You can go out to do battle. A fortress was never meant to be a place where you hid away forever. All these various words then, taken together, tell us a bit about what God, God does for his people. In him, we find a place of shelter, a hiding place. In him, we find a place of seclusion, a place of peace and rest. In him, we can find protection from the full force of the law. In him, we find a sure defense against the wiles of the enemy. Down through the ages, many have found God to be their refuge. Just over 500 years ago, Martin Luther initiated the Protestant Reformation with his protest against the hypocrisy of the church. It was a time of great turmoil. Many believers were persecuted for their faith. The emperor declared Luther an outlaw. He was no longer afforded the protection of the emperor. Anyone could kill him. Luther found a place of refuge in a castle, the Wartburg Castle, high up on a hill. There he hid out in disguise for some time. Luther knew what it was to fear for his life. And he wrote a hymn celebrating the refuge that he found in the Lord. It became the hymn of the Reformation, and sometimes we're still singing today. A mighty fortress is our God, a bulwark never failing. Our helper, he, amidst the flood of mortal ills prevailing. For still our ancient foe does seek to work us woe. His craft and power are great, and armed with cruel hate on earth is not his equal. Did we in our own strength confide, our striving would be losing. We're not the right man on our side, the man of God's own choosing. Just ask who that may be. Christ Jesus, it is he. Lord Sabaoth his name. From age to age the same, and he must win the battle. And though this world with devils filled should threaten to undo us, we will not fear, for God hath willed his truth to triumph through us. Amen to God and his blessing then to his word this morning. I trust there's something there that God can use to be a help and a strength to you. If there's anything said here today, if you've got a concern or a question about it, I'm happy to meet with you and speak with you further, as always. The invitation remains open. You can leave this morning knowing that all is well between you and your God. <coughs> Will you come and lead us in a final hymn together?